Hi, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the uh, 1010 session on technology development blockchain. We appreciate everyone coming today. I uh, wasn't quite sure how many people would attend. I think I, I picked the over. I had 25 uh, or over, and I think I counted about 33 in the room, so that's good. Not counting the panelists. So uh, I think, I think it's, it's a great turnout for a, a Wednesday morning, the second to the last uh, set of sessions. So welcome, everyone. Um, what I'd like to do first is have each of our panelists introduce themselves for a quick minute, and then we're going to spend five to seven minutes each talking a little bit about what their firms do and what they're seeing in the market, and then we'll loop back and talk a little bit more about some of the things that are going on in the market in terms of developments right now, and then uh, that'll probably take us close to the 45 to 50 minutes, and then we'll leave a little bit of time at the end for, for a question and answer. So um, maybe, Linda, if you want to start in the introductions. Hi, I'm Linda Bartosh. I'm a partner at Deckert LLP, which is a law firm, and uh, we focus on um, securitizations, financings of all different kinds in all kinds of asset classes. Um, as well as other types of financings. In the financial world of yesterday, yeah, selling money was the norm. Uh, firms profited from gatekeeping and routine legal fees piled up like barriers to innovation. And we witnessed an era where actual issue or value delivered that was often overshadowed by the cost of accessing capital. And that's really the problem we're trying to tackle with block transfers, rethinking a lot of the underlying securities infrastructure we have in place so that you know today we're, we're spearheading, spearheading a pivotal, sh pivotal shift as a blockchain transfer agent and moving from a model where financial services are commodities sold at a premium to one where we facilitate and deliver decentralized systems at competitive rates. Uh, and we think there's just a lot of change that can, we can all bring to this market that was, uh, for example, showcased by the recent GameStop short squeeze when it comes to the underlying infrastructure because the services that we offer that we can give to the market to create accessibility and an open system, they are what let us end an era of selling money and introduce an era where we're adding value and we're committing to empowering global investors and issuers with ongoing transparency. I, uh, <coughs> I'm a Lok Sena. Uh, I've been a serial CEO, uh, five continents. I'm an author, books published in New York, London, uh, New Delhi. And there was a point in time in my life when I was doing 400,000 miles a day, and I said, enough of that, uh, uh, 400,000 miles a year uh, aircraft travel, and I said, enough of that, and that's the time when uh, my partner and I, we started this company called Istaka Baza, which basically, mean, basically means blockchain in Sanskrit. Uh, the Indian government didn't allow us that point in time. They were very punitive on anything to do with block or chain. So we went native, and the mandarins uh, didn't get it. So that's the reason why we keep the name in the US, too. We are, uh, we are in Longwood. And hi, I'm Patrick Tatey. I lead our structured finance business at Wilmington Trust. We provide trustee, paying agency, and custodial services to the marketplace. Um, I've been fascinated by distributed ledger technology or blockchain for the past six years. We've done a couple um, working prototypes, and we've been working with a lot of large issuers and other entities to, um, to bring this more into the, the prevalent market. So with that, um, maybe I'll, look, I'll turn it back to you, and maybe you can discuss a little bit about what your firm's been doing in the space, take five minutes or so, and, and talk about sort of you know, how you see tokenization and fractionalization, and then um, we'll go down the line, John and, and Linda, same thing. So great. Sure. sure. Thanks, Patrick. Thank you. So uh, you know, we approach the, the problem with a view that we need a, we take a big problem have a great solution and it impacts a lot of people. So we were sure, you know, we were clear that we're not going to use something which is very specific. We wanted to do the whole thing. So the platform, uh, it has two parts. Both of them can work independently uh, they, and they can work together. Uh, so the first part is what we call as the permission blockchain. Now, just to remind, permission blockchain is KYC. This is the ones which are used by uh, the countries for, for publishing you know, digital currencies, most of the banks use it, Hyperledger, and that's, what, that's the infrastructure that we're using. 
And we use the permission blockchain to run, to run end to end uh, of the home mortgage ecosystem. So you know, it begins from the uh, originator, originator and the loan, uh, uh, the, the guys who originate the loans, selling to the investors, the investors in turn pooling it, selling to investment bankers or issuers, issuers breaking it down into bonds, mortgage-backed bonds, and selling to the hedge funds, uh, mutual funds, and, and, and venture funds. So that's one part of this whole piece. The second part of this whole piece is about uh, uh, the public side. So this is the private side of the chain, uh, completely KYC'd, heavily regulated. Not to say that the public side that we are using is not KYC'd and heavily regulated, but yeah, the, the public side of the chain is to do more with the tokenization uh, and, and fractionalization, which, is, which, which I'll talk in a little while. Right? So the way we look at the, uh, the platform is a vertical ecosystem and a horizontal ecosystem. So you know, this is a highly inclusive platform. Uh, we know there will be disruption, but we need to make sure that the disruption is, is over a period of time. So the vertical ecosystem is where the money moves. So the loan getting converted into a pool, getting converted into a, a, a bond. Whereas the horizontal ecosystem is more on helping the transaction move. So uh, all the, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, the due diligence companies, the rating agencies, uh, the trusts, for example, uh, the transfer agents, they are all on the horizontal side. They help move the transaction. So we, we break it into those two pieces. Now, why did we, uh, why did we use blockchain? Where did we uh, stumble upon this problem? So the problem was very simple. One of our customers, who's a correspondent lender, was taking anywhere between 14 days to 28 days to transfer the loan to the, the, the investors. And, and I can take names, UWM, uh, Rocket Mortgage, C CMG, you know. And the reason was that once the loan originated, uh, the closing documents were, you know, hundreds of sheets of documents, which were getting transferred in a, in a PDF format. Now, PDF is akin to, to manipulation or change, right? And that is the reason why the buyer actually, his uh, 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 underwriting standards disallows and, you know, it insists that the whole thing needs to be redone again. But you know, uh, it was funny, we realized that the loan changes hands many times. So from the correspondent lender to the, to the investor, the investor pools, sells it to the likes of JP Morgan or securitizers. JP takes anywhere between you know, four and six weeks. Uh, and JP is not specific, any investment banker takes because it's validating the pool. And Beyond that, uh, you know, if, if you're securitizing, it takes anywhere between four weeks to six weeks to get from due diligence to find securitization. We have squeezed all of this together. I think we can do it in less than three to four weeks, end to end. Uh, the fact that all the, the, uh, the loan originates on chain uh, ensures that the documents are immutable. So the difference between a blockchain and a regular system is on a blockchain only add is allowed, no amend, no, no delete can be done. So you know, the, the, the documents, the data is patent, cannot be changed. And that's the reason why we've done that. We use the public side because that is the next wave we think. So uh, around $16 trillion of real world assets are needed to come to the chain, and there is a, many reasons why that needs to be done. And so we, we convert the loan into an NFT or a, or a token, it's called an RWA token, real world asset token. We pool a set of NFTs and convert into a pool of NF, uh, uh, an NFT uh, pool. And then we fractionalize using something called 3643, which is an approved tokens for transfer of, of, of security. And that's, that's what we're doing. Okay, great. Maybe, John, you can give a little bit about what your firm's looking to do and uh, some background. Yeah, I'm totally with you there, Look, There are a lot of inefficiencies in some of these old systems. 
I remember I started Log Transfer because I was running a small friends and family fund, and after our largest trade ever, we ended up paying a third of our profits to the broker in commissions and fees. And we realized, I mean, there's got to be a, a better way to set all this up than to go through that. A really pivotal point for understanding the technology and trying to rebuild the whole securities trading and settlement system for us was when Vitalik Buterin, if you remember, the co-founder of Ethereum called Bitcoin an API for money. And that was really an awakening moment for, for the financial world we saw. It was a realization that money could be programmed, that digital currency could be as innovative as the code it's built on. And that code is really a representation of the human system's beliefs and processes we have that we put into the system. So we can really design it in any way that we want to fit our goals, to fit the regulations, and to build a new system. And so that's when we took the spark of brilliance and ran with it, creating an end-to-end -end platform for equity securities that's fully documented and overseen by the SEC, ready for all investor settlement today. And I think we stand amidst an industry at a crossroads where we're really questioning the old ways of excessive costs and gatekeeping and replacing them no longer by selling access, uh, but really by enabling progress in the whole market and giving the tools and the power back to the issuers, to the investors, and creating an inclusive global ecosystem. Blockchain might seem nascent today, but I promise you it is anything but. And the businesses of tomorrow are watching exponential growth rates in adoption. And, and let me know what you think, Alec. Let me know what you think, Linda. Don't you think Web3 could potentially bankrupt every single sponsor of this event in five to 10 years if they fail to follow today's innovators as we've seen through these panels over the last couple of days? Companies and investors, they're really waking up to the reality that the blockchain will redefine capitalism, replace the antiquated rent-seeking centralized systems, and it's our job to make sure that this blockchain works in accordance with the goals, the objectives that we can build together so that we have an inclusive financial system that works for, for everyone. Thank you. Linda, what, uh, maybe you can talk a little bit about some of the things that you've been seeing and working on at Decker. Yeah, I'd love to talk about that, but I do, since John posed the direct question, I'd love yes. to engage on that for a minute. Um, you know, we've been talking for years now about blockchain coming to the finance space and how transformative it's going to be. And, you know, here we still are, still talking about it. Um, you know, we, we know there have been <clears throat> a number of securitizations on blockchain, but I, for someone who's on a blockchain panel, probably remains somewhat of a skeptic that <clears throat> all of these gatekeeping or rent-seeking functions will go away. And I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing, right? Um, obviously, there are some efficiencies to be gained and things that values that can be unlocked by blockchain, but there are real world values to some of these gatekeeping uh, mechanisms as well. You know, if you think about the policies that underlie securities law, that underlie regulation of financial markets to create market stability, functional markets, fraud protection, you know, some of those things can and should be built into smart contracts and other things that you're thinking about when you're designing a blockchain system. But at the end of the day, uh, you know, you want to make sure that you have some of those gatekeepers still um, in the process. They have a role to play on the blockchain in the securitizations. Um, you know, you don't want to make uh, securities laws violations. You don't want to take advantage of consumers. You don't want to cheat people out of their retirement savings. And so, uh, you know, will the entire financial ecosystem go away? Should the entire financial ecosystem go away? Um, you know, I think there's a role for every current financial market participant to play in the future of blockchain and securitization and blockchain and financial markets more broadly. Now, they won't all keep up. I think there's a lot of innovation that they'll have to do and be on top of in order to keep up with how things are changing and evolving in the markets. And there probably will be some winners and some losers and some people who can't adapt and so kind of fall off the wayside and other companies um, <clears throat> including, you know, Patrick's, um, who has been a, a leader in this space, who will continue to show that they're um, paying attention to what people are looking for value-wise to be unlocked by blockchain in the markets and will continue to add value to transactions. So 
I'm maybe a little bit more skeptical that all of our companies <laughs> will, will be bankrupt in five or ten years, yeah, it, probably it, to the relief of many people in this room. So it, it's interesting because I think that, you know there's one entity I won't say who, but but they, they have their stated objective was to basically eliminate all counterparties in the transaction, right. and I think they, they've come to realize that that's probably not the right approach, and that you do need you say people to, to validate, to check, to make sure things are right, which it goes a bit against the decentralized thought of DLT to begin with. But I think that the biggest hurdle to me is going to be investor acceptance. And you know, once investors start getting more and more comfortable with the thought of buying stuff on chain, and there's a secondary market that develops, I think that's when the, then, then maybe the light bulb will go on and things will maybe go a little bit quicker. I mean, I think back to mortgages as an example and electronic mortgages. I mean, you know, we run a document custody site and it's a big warehouse with a ton of paper in it. You know, 10 or 15 years ago, I think the thought process was everything's going to go to electronic at some point and we won't see paper anymore. I'm still not sure it's even 10% of the mortgages that get underwritten are, are actually electronic. So there's acceptance, but it hasn't been like huge acceptance yet. You know, I think the GSEs have, would like to push more on that. But again, it's ultimate investors who still have to get comfortable with it. So. You bring up some great points, and I, I think some, some things that, you know, maybe, uh, Alok, we can go back to you, and I know you have some thoughts on it. Yeah. I have some thoughts on, uh, on this. So I, I think we need to be outside of the two extremes, uh, that it's useless and it's very useful. I think this, the path is somewhere in between. So let me explain what I... So I, we think we are like... Uh, so the platform is like a, a freeway, a, a highway, and anyone can come inside at any point in time and exit at any point in time, right? And uh, what is the benefit that you derive is the amount that you remain in the freeway. Uh, and if you're outside of the freeway, obviously you're hit with traffic. Uh, you know, a simpler example is organic food. You need to start from the soil, right? So there are benefits and then there are controls. I think we're talking both together, right? So. Uh, if, if we look at the end-to-end -end cash flows that can be released, and remember, this is a $14 trillion industry from one end to another, we think 25 to 60 days of cash flow on this $14 trillion can be removed because of the inefficiency, because of the friction. Now, why it is happening? Because, and, and, and to your point, uh, uh, Linan, uh, at each point in time when the loan book is getting transferred from one to another, there's a legal due diligence, which you don't need to, I, I understand you need to do it once, mm -hmm. but you don't need to do it every time. You don't need to do it when you're selling to the investor. You don't need to do it when you're selling it to the investment bank and at a pool. You don't need to do it. So you do it at one point and then you use, you harness that, right? So, and depending upon where you enter and where you exit, you could get a 20 bips uh, efficiency gain, or you could get a 200 bips, right? Mm -hmm. Now, parts that you are talking about, and Patrick, I know someone did mention uh, that trust won't be available. Right? You don't need the trust. Now, let me, again, so uh, there is $16 trillion worth of real world asset that needs to come on chain, okay? And that's next six years. This is real numbers, this is BCG, they're not unreal numbers. And why do you want those assets to come on chain? You want those assets to come on chain because settlement is instantaneous, it's not T plus one, you counterparties are identified, you don't need to do anything else. But, but the fact that I own a piece of land or I own a piece of commercial property, who's going to guarantee that property has moved under a trust or an SPV? And that property has been fractionalized into a bond. Well, I don't think the function of trust will ever go away because people just don't trust anyone other than the trust. And hence our, hence our name. <laughs> and and but there are other people pieces, right? So when you are issuing bonds, you're doing bond valuations on the basis of service or data that is coming in, sir, right? This is continuous. You don't need a person trying to do that because that's a smart contract. When you are getting the money inside, you need to pay the money to the bondholders, right? You need to divide the losses, reverse equity. All that can be done automatically by, by, by smart contracts. So I think we need all of them, right? It's, it's a, a technology will change the lay of the land. But some 
places, the need will be less, but the opportunity will be infinite. I mean, it, it'll be like 100 times more than what it is today. In some cases, the, the need will be much more, and, and you know, it'll kill the inefficiency. I mean, that's my view, of course. Yeah. yeah, I mean, and I think that's what's exciting about blockchain, exactly to your point of, you know, trust, you still need trust, you still need to know that your sources for information are, uh, have integrity. Um, but, you know, maybe you don't do the initial due diligence anymore, but what other diligence do you do? What un other diligence does blockchain unlock that maybe you couldn't do before? You know, I think one of the exciting developments is if you think about a current securitization, how do you get reporting on that? Well, you know, there's quarterly reporting that happens, goes to the servicer, they process it for two quarters, and then three quarters later, it might finally come to investors, right? Your, your cash management period might start a full year after the deal's that's performance right. dictated that it be in, in cash management. And maybe that's great if you're the sponsor of a securitization and you get a whole extra year out of cash trap. But if you're an investor, you wanna know where's my money going? Um, and so I think having payment processing happen in real time or close to real time um, depending on you know the type of asset class, obviously there's um, waterfalls that need to happen based on performance and budgets that have to get updated and all of that kind of stuff. Where it might you know still have like a month delay, but you get quicker settlements. You get the reporting generated based on the actual real time performance of the assets. You might actually have meaningful granular asset level performance data that you can look at, um, and then you can take that information and actually make more real time decisions. Um, whether it's you know a decision as a sponsor on how you're managing assets, a decision as a servicer about how you might need to intervene in a platform, whether you want to agree to a budget amendment or something, or a decision as an investor about do you want to continue to hold this? What is the price that you're going to be willing to sell it for if you are going to be willing to sell it or if you're looking to buy into a transaction? Um, and I just, I, I think that transparency is actually what's really exciting. And I don't know if it's less diligence as a result, no, but don't, no, I think it might, different diligence it could be different. Yeah. yeah, I think it's, you brought up a great point. I mean, I think about a mortgage and say I, the, the due date's uh, March 1st, right? You typically as an investor won't see that payment until April 25th, 55 days. I mean, that's convention. I think on blockchain, investors Ooh. could get that immediately. Now that doesn't help other entities who play the float game, you know, like trustees, but, but that's, if I were an investor, that's what I would want. And the same thing with like, you know, is it going to go into delinquency? You can, you'll know right away. I also think about reps and warranties and the, the you know, underwriting guidelines. Like, I think being on blockchain could make a massive difference. And if something does, a loan does go bad, what caused it to go bad? Was it a life event? You know, the borrower lost his or her job, or they had a medical emergency, or was it truly fraud? I mean, it makes a difference. Whatever the determination is, will make a difference in how that loan is treated, and whether the investor takes a loss. They, they sign up for certain you know, life events and things like that, but they don't sign up for fraud. So I, I do think being on chain will make a much quicker determination for a lot of valuation and, and making decisions. Maybe John, uh, you know, you're, you're looking like you have some, some thoughts too. Well, a couple of days on the trust admin panel, you know, they're talking about these challenges with reporting structures and the time delays, as we talked about, are certainly huge. One of the big things we've seen with bringing this data on chain over the past few years and documenting this whole system publicly and getting it under review by the SEC is that when you go through the process of making an open decentralized protocol for compliantly you know, following the rules and, and getting the capital to the companies from the investors and enabling that trading without the traditional middlemen, it forces you to define, to put into code your rules, your assumptions. and your standards for data reporting, for example. Because as we know, there's really not a lot of standardized cross industry for mortgage facts, for different kinds of trust, what they report, when they report, and the actual format even isn't very well defined in a lot of cases. And so when we build out these systems that are open to the public, that have transparent data, even if it's pseudonymous, they have transparent data that anyone can look at and see what's happening in real time with securitization, it creates a new layer, a new piece of infrastructure, sort of like when the web came to be. Anyone could read from it. It's the same thing with these early stages of Web3, where now you're opening up scrutiny, not just to the investment bankers, but to the investors themselves. They can do their own algorithms. They can build their own fun technologies on top of that. And when you have the standards 
that the regulators approve, the regulators agree with, the companies agree with, and the investors agree with. Now you have a new system that everyone can constructively go through forward knowing that there's going to be more efficiency, that we're not going to have to worry about, do, you know, is there risk that this data is improperly formatted? Is there risk that I'm going to have to go and process this all again? And it comes in stages. Interestingly, Alok, you mentioned the idea early on in this talk that there are different stages. There's the idea of, okay, well, we have the securities that we're recording on the blockchain for the accounting purposes, but what about the subscriptions? Are those off-chain or the fund documents off-chain? Um, the panel just before this, we had a company that does the fund documents all off-chain, then brings them on-chain, the interest payments on-chain. So there are certainly shades of gray with how this gets implemented, but the closer we can get to having as much data as possible on-chain, on -chain, why don't we talk, you know, do you have thoughts yeah, on that? Is so that we do exactly that. Yeah. I mean, so from the point where the pool is rated to the point where you issue the documents to the investors, uh, to the point where the, uh, the, you know, the bonds are issued and bought and sold, all of that is on chain. And remember, uh, some part of it uh, needs to be on the private chain, some on the public chain. And by the way, the fact that the new standard uh, token 3643 has been approved, it is an approved token, right? It's like a security, and why did SEC do it? I mean, yeah, they're, they're, not, they're never clear about the approval, there's somewhere in between, but yeah, usable. It's because these tokens can only reside in white-listed wallets. The tokens can be, so a TLIQ, can hold the tokens, can freeze them, unfreeze, if some st someone steals, you can pull it back from that wallet to your own wallet. I mean, there is a level of, even on the, on, on the Web3 side, there is a level of understanding and agreement that it cannot be free for all. And, and that's what we're doing, absolutely. Uh, the whole, I just want to add one other piece. So, you know, we're trying to uh, effect uh, this, this, this efficiency by reducing the size of the pool. Uh, and I'll come back to it in, in one, you know, at another point, just after this. So today the pool sizes are 200, uh, 200 million, 300 million, 500 million. You're not able to securitize a $30 million pool. And the cost is not just the cost of, uh, uh, it's, the, it's the legal cost, by the way. <laughs> and I, I was, so I have a very close friend in a very, very, I mean, just like you, another legal firm based out of uh, California. And I was telling him that, is there a way we can templatize this? And he says, no, you can't. And I said, why? I understand that there are, you know, loans worth 30 million. You need to go through the diligence of each of those. And if it is, you know, 1 billion, the diligence is higher. But what about preparation of the document itself? We said, no, we can't duplicate it. And I said, this is where the chat GBDs will come in. So the grunt work will go away for sure. I mean, yeah, but today we're discussing the grunt work will go away for sure. The price of securitization will drop down. So today, that's a very big inhibitor, right? Every time you securitize the cost of ratings, the cost of uh, due diligence, and sorry about that, uh, Linda, uh, is, is is fixed, you just can't move it. And that's the future, it will come down. It will come down, I think so. Okay. Uh, Lynn, I know you would also have some thoughts about regulatory and, and kind of where things are in the process. Do you wanna maybe elaborate on that? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the interesting things that happens with blockchain regulations is Sometimes it seems like people forget that blockchain exists outside of cryptocurrency. <clears throat> um, <laughs> and it just <laughs> tends to get lumped in together. Um, and, you know, sometimes it seems like regulators do the same thing. Um, and they only introduce specific blockchain regulations in connection with cryptocurrency regulations. But I think we're starting to see people thinking about this a little more, you know, especially if you think of doing this in a DeFi capacity. Um, you know, what attributes of a blockchain would make it an exchange, for example, or, um, you know, what attributes does a blockchain have to have to ensure that it is <clears throat> helping all of the parties that are involved 
uh, satisfy whatever their existing regulatory requirements are. Can the blockchain be used to, um, obviously, on AML and KYC type compliance, we've talked about that a lot, but what if it can help you, um, you know, track and record if you're making QM loans that you did your ability to repay work mm -hmm. and then you have that as an auditable record that you can look at in <clears throat> the blockchain to show to your regulators that you've satisfied your obligations and any time that you sell those loans in the future, whether through a whole loan sale or securitization, you know, you're, you're not kicking loans out of the pool because you've lost the diligence, right? You have to keep your ability to repay records on file. Um, or you can get in trouble with the regulator. So th now those can't be lost. Or what if you're a bank who is trying to show how you're satisfying your regulatory capital requirements um, and you can use blockchain to show how you're doing that. And there's, I guess, some discussions going on about um, if blockchain could affect what your regulatory capital requirements are, but we'll leave that for <laughs> other panels. <laughs> um, um, but, you know, they're, they're really still, it, at least in the United States anyway, other countries are a little bit different. Reg regulators still seem to be letting sort of the market explore what it wants to use blockchain for and haven't really been imposing a ton of regulations yet. But that isn't, you know, to imply that you can use blockchain in a fully unregulated capacity. Obviously, any, re any legal requirements that would apply to any securitization still apply to a blockchain securitization. Yeah. So. Um, it's really just a question of how can you use blockchain to make it easier to satisfy them, easier to do your compliance, um, and just use it as one more tool to sort of reduce those initial, not only those initial setup costs, but also your ongoing compliance and monitoring and audit requirement costs and uh, regulatory inquiry costs and all of those things. So uh, it's, it's, not, it's not just, you know, a technology to show data moving more cleanly or clearly, but there's other value, I think, that it has to unlock for financial institutions, too. I've, I've seen uh, entities starting to use it for um, Community Reinvestment Act, as an example. You know, that they, they can have everything in one place, and they can show regulars right away instead of, you know, amassing paper and doing things like that. I mean, I think about it again, I go back to the rep and warranty issues of 2008 through 2010, and there was one entity that was doing due diligence. They had a warehouse literally filled with transaction documents. They had no idea if they had everything. They didn't know to which underwriting guidelines and loans were underwritten. I mean, it was, it was a massive, massive, under, you know, inefficient, costly. You know, now, I think you could do a lot of that stuff without having all the paper. And I mean, I guess one other, this isn't necessarily like regulatory top down, but maybe regulatory helpful is um, if you've heard of the UCC amendments that are currently in front of all of the states creating digital asset categories within the UCC. They're one of the initial headaches, I think, in trying to figure out how to implement um, blockchain for financial products and securitizations um, was just the uncertainty of how these assets were going to be treated under the UCC. What does it mean to perfect an asset or a token? Are you perfecting on whatever the real world asset is? Are you perfecting on the token? Are you perfecting on both? If you're perfecting on the token, how do you do that? Mm -hmm. So those, the, the request to the states anyway, is to adopt this UCC amendment, a new Article 12 in by 2025 or for 2025 effectiveness. Um, you know, we'll see if all the states get there on time, but hopefully at least in states critical to finance like New York and Delaware, yeah, and, you know, we'll, we'll see that adoption. And I think that as that kind of certainty where lenders and creditors and investors have comfort that their security interests will be perfected, they'll be recognized as secured creditors in bankruptcy, um, becomes more established and well protected and tested in courts importantly. I think that is not necessarily the same kind of trust that we're talking about when we're talking about trust in data or trust in transactions, but it's a trust in the system, I think, that needs to be there and needs to be tested before we see really widespread adoption from financial institutions, especially, you know, the more regulated ones. Yeah, they're all great points, Linda. So we have about 10 minutes and we'll leave five minutes for questions. I'm gonna pull a bit of an audible um, and maybe ask each of you, when do you think that there becomes more acceptance. And, you know, hopefully it's not three to five years from now, but depending on what, what are you guys' thoughts, like, you know, will we be having this panel next year and talking about 
10% of the market has gone blockchain, or is it is that pie in the sky? So maybe, uh, maybe John, I'll start with you, and then Alok, and then uh, Linda. With you there, Patrick, and the potential is really important, but I think it comes back a lot to what Linda said, like with these UCC changes, for instance, there's this real question of how do we look at these assets, and a lot of people are struggling with that. And I think the biggest thing, the biggest challenge, is that a lot of the current and past approaches for th putting these assets on the blockchain, making them digital assets that anyone can access. In the past, it's come through this sort of ADR model where you deposit in and you have a one-to-one -one representation, and that's sort of been the standard for how industrial players have approached the challenge. And that is not the approach that we took from day one. It was always the asset on the chain is the asset. The record on the chain is the entitlement. It is the master record of shareholders in the company. And that is, for some reason, a radical approach. And that slight differentiation changes completely how you look at the oversight of it. Because now it's not, uh, you know, we have a change on chain, but we need to confirm it, and we need to do this other contract privately, and we have to involve this private actor. And instead, you just observe the chain, the, the incumbent, the, the provider, the company doing the securitization is just another peer in the network with the same privileges to view the data as everyone else. And when that happens, when you have, for instance, a bank where their dollar deposits are recorded entirely on chain and it's just the record on chain that denominates your balance and, and sure there are investor protections and things, um, that's where there, I think we can really expand the pie and yes, we're going we're gonna to decrease the fees and the expenses that we can take in as these uh, financial institutions, but we're really going to grow it so much and evolve from selling money to infusing money with technology and, and making capital smarter, faster, and more accessible. So we can place the drudgery and the routine on the expense of these legalities with the efficiencies of smart contracts, the transparency of decentralized ledgers, and really build the foundation for an entirely new financial ecosystem uh, that's not focused on fees or complex regulations, but the courage to embrace change and to make a new reality for these investors so that everyone has the tool. as a community where the technology enables everyone to, through this code, bring it into existence and let anyone invest in their own bridges to success. Thanks. Look, what are, you, what are your thoughts on timing? So, uh, and quickly, yeah, I'll yeah, try to so, so first is to identify the size of the opportunity itself. Uh, and the opportunity is huge. So, you know, we've been working with South, uh, South Americans in the Central American region. They want to create something called CAMA, uh, Central American Mortgage Association. We've been working with the Indians. Uh, you'll be surprised the Indian banks have close to a trillion dollars in loans as loan books. That's it. Now, all of this needs to be securitized because when you securitize, you, you create liquidity and then you can inject that money into development of a country. So we're working with South Africa, we're working with India, we're working with South America on, on this. And, and this is all blockchain based, right? Mm -hmm. Also, I talked about the uh, RWA, the real world asset tokenization. Now, what do you mean by tokenization? So tokenization is nothing but the representation of a, of a physical asset on the chain, and sometimes it could be, uh, uh, you know, real, real documents which are under custody. All of that in the token, right? What is the what is fractionalization? Is nothing but securitization. You're breaking the token into multiple pieces so that people can have small. They can own small, smaller pieces, right? Yes, it's tranching. Yeah. And this is all asset class. Today we are talking only about, uh, uh, you know, loans. This is true for loans, this is true for credit card loans, this is true for ships, anything. Everything can come inside because you have, a, you have an asset, you tokenize, you tokenize, and then you fractionize. And I also want to add here that it will be inclusive. I don't think in the near future we will be able to exclude uh, the, the participants, the existing participants, you know, the big changes. But uh, maybe 10%. The way uh, people talk to us, maybe 10 percent, I, I think that's where we will be. Yeah, that'd be a great accomplishment. Yeah. As I said, you know, electronic mortgages, I'm not sure is 10 percent, and that's been decades. So mm -hmm. hopefully we can accelerate on this front. Linda, what about you? What are your thoughts? Um, you know, 
I think that change in this space maybe a little bit comes as a result of cost savings or process efficiencies, but I think change in this space is really going to be driven by investors. If investors think that there's value to be unlocked in the way that they think about holding assets, trading assets, you know, if it makes a difference for their liquidity, um, I think to the extent that investors start asking sponsors for this, that's what's going to make a difference. You know, one of the things that I think about a lot um, is artificial intelligence. And to the extent that you have good data, you have the potential for good artificial intelligence. So if you think about what blockchain could do for data creation and data management and data integrity, and think about pairing that with artificial intelligence, I think that there is a high potential for value to be unlocked there, both in terms of making that data closer to real time, making it more accurate, and making it more comprehensive. You can have it talk directly to the AI, and maybe if investors think that they have value that they can unlock there, then that'll drive them to put the pressure on the sponsors to, to do this. I do think it'll be an uneven adoption because there are some asset classes that just naturally lend themselves better to being on blockchain um, or at least to having a lower barrier to being on blockchain. Anything that is, you know, exists just as a loan, just as a financial asset, easy to put on blockchain, right? You can have a native digital loan and that's fine. If you have a real, real world asset, like a piece of property or like a ship, it's always going to be a representation of that. So there's definitely still value to unlock there as we've talked about, but you're always gonna have that on-chain, off-chain tension. Um, you know, maybe we do this right now with securitizations. Sometimes a securitization is a pool of loans, but there are also securitizations that are one loan representing a large pool of assets. So maybe it's more something like that, where the, the thing that is on the blockchain isn't the real world asset, but it's a loan or another financial instrument that's derivative of the cash flow on that asset or something like that. And maybe that's how we move more directly onto on-chain um, assets. You obviously then still have to worry about what do you have the security interest in and how are you perfecting it and how are you establishing the trust that this thing that you have on the chain really represents some kind of an ownership right. interest in real life, sort of the issues that we've been trying to work through for years now. Um, but, you know, if there's value to be unlocked there, I think the market participants will be interested in unlocking it. Yeah, definitely investors, I think, will drive this at the end of the day. So we're, we're about five minutes left. Um, I'm going to take a pause here and see if the audience has any questions. Yes, Dane. Yeah, I want to follow up on, I don't know if this I'll follow up on Linda Ann, because you were saying, you know, this is a paradigm shift. And like, kind of like the web and retail bank, it's going to happen regardless. I don't think they got any of the cost savings they thought they were going to get on the web. Or fake, or cost on the web. So now you got two big ones technology-wise. You got AI, and then you got blockchain. And AI is dependent on the quality of the data that goes into that. And we've seen now, recently in the paper, the fiasco that Google has there at AI, right? So this caused a huge credibility hit in financial services, I would imagine. So do you think that the need for AI, and there's a huge need, sucking noise for the need for AI in financial services. Do you think that will pull the, or accelerate the adoption of blockchain because the quality of the data is, well, is really the reason for blockchain? I definitely think that is a reason that people are, I never got a chance to talk about this, but paying attention to blockchain again. Um, you know, we had a couple of years ago where we had the first couple of securitizations on chain as kind of like the proof of concept, and then everyone was sort of holding their breath to see, will everyone do this now? And the answer was no, right? Um, but we recently have been seeing an increased interest in people revisiting, should we come back to blockchain? And I think that is a big reason why. That said, I think there are ways that you can improve data integrity and data collection without having to be on blockchain. So I'm, I'm curious to see, as people are examining the costs that go into these transactions and figuring out what do you do um, with AI, um, if that means that just a premium is put on data collection and we find out a way to collect data, track data, sell data better, or if it really has to be blockchain that unlocks it, I'm not sure. Well, once it's on the blockchain, you really obfuscate the ability to have central gate kept control over the data, and it democratizes who can even build those models that Dane brought up. 
where it's, it's not just, you know, you have to have this Bloomberg subscription, for instance, to build your training data. Like, you can just pull up a node and do it yourself. It just completely eliminates the barrier to entry for these new investing innovators. That's a great, that's a great point. Yeah, absolutely. Any, any, we have a couple other questions, right? Right here, maybe? I mean, at this point, with the proof of concept, like if you look at a figure securitization, pretty much everything is, on, well, I mean, theoretically everything is on chain, right? These are native digital assets. They are loans that originated electronically. The securitization is all on the chain. The payments are all processed on the chain. The reporting is on chain. Um, they are still real estate secured at the end of the day. So you still have to have um, you know, your, your mortgage in the local recording office at the county level um, and things like that. But, you know, from a proof of concept, I think we've seen that it is possible to have a high percentage of your transaction actually yeah, on if I can, If I can add to that, yeah. Jinda, please. for us, it's 100%. So you got a pool of, pool of loans. Uh, those loans need to go to the due diligence company. We generate the ASF tape. So the ASF tape is 158 fields, one for each loan. We generate that. Those guys fix the ASF. Once the ASF fixed, it goes to the rating agencies. And remember, the rating agencies cannot see anything which, is, uh, which has PI, personal information. So we have a 17G5 classified document, and all this is inside. We don't take things out and shove it somewhere else under a 17G5. Everything is inside. So the moment that tranche, the, the loan pool moves to rating, the rating agencies and the 17G5 documents are available. Uh, we track everything, the stipulations on, on chain. So, you know, there is no chain. Uh, and they don't do the, 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 the liability side for reasons that I don't want to talk about, but uh, they do the asset side, right? And once this is completed, we generate the document for the issue, right? Uh, the document is issued. We, we, there is pre-placement, pre and we, can, we stop there in case you don't need a digital token. But if you need a real digital token, we go right across, create the digital token, and then tokenize the entire piece. So payouts automated, real time, you, you get the valuation of the bonds, real time. You don't need to wait uh, uh, anymore. In fact, we gamify such that the borrowers give us early information because we give them rewards. They give us early information and we know in advance, even before the servicer node, that the money has been paid. So our models are far more, so yeah, you can do all of that. I mean, everything depends on want and everything depends on giving a little bit of rewards to people who are helping you achieve that. Yeah, we do end-to-end, 100%. -end, so we, we have time for one more question. I know this gentleman over here, so please. Yeah. I, I can hear you this time, yeah. The, just all of the, all the things you're discussing depend on the stable coins, obviously. No. You, how do you have a DBP settlement process without the stable coins? You, can't, you don't have any on-chain DBP settlement without the stable coins. No, we, we don't depend on stable coins. So there are only $40 billion worth of stable coins in the world. Yeah. This end-to-end -end is $15 trillion a year. You cannot use stable coins. So you use fiat, so that's why I said we have two parts. You use fiat uh, for the permission chain and you use uh, stable coins for the non-permission chain. But usually you won't find uh, you know, retail buying bonds. If they do, they can use the... the, the uh, the so, but the, you, yeah. can't have, you can't have a DBP process on chain with fiat. So there is maybe, maybe um, anyway, maybe, maybe if you guys maybe want to take this off. I mean, payments I are hard. You know, it's it's difficult. There's so many fiat systems. There's a lot to do. eBay launched without payments. You had to mail a, someone a check with FedEx. Airbnb launched without payments. Imagine that process. There are even problems, challenges with Stripe starting up with the infrastructure of payments. Payment, payments are difficult, and there is certainly a lot of value to be created in making that efficient, putting that on chain. And, and the question, 
you know, a lot of people say you can just trade it for Bitcoin. Bitcoin is your, is your money. And, you know, maybe that's true in some cases, but maybe we need to have adoption of some kind of unified currency on chain to do it. The question is when it's going to happen, because it's, it's not an if. It's going to happen, and it will enable anyone to trade these securities with what they're used right. to seeing in a dollar or in a fiat denominated value. Uh, and so if we can get these securities on chain first, I think that's a poll to get innovators in the payment space to get more things on chain for those circles of the world. To, because if there's the investor demand, I want to buy this tokenized security. Okay, well. Somebody will come up with a solution then. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Well, again, um, we're, now we're over time. I'm getting a high sign here. But I want to thank you all, first off, the audience for coming in uh, late, late uh, in the process, but also my esteemed panelists. So well done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.